he's walking me through it. Yep, no problem. Okay, we got our own little folder. <laughs> oh, these are interesting. Did you find it? Do you see it? Yeah. Um, do you have a bigger version of that? Okay, not really. This is the size that was up here in this school. Okay. okay. Oh, this is fine. Yeah, you can just zoom in. Okay, cool, cool. Right there. That'll work. And then what was the other one? Go back to where. Well, you can't have them up simultaneously because you got two files. I guess they can't be up simultaneously. Okay, that's fine. Oh. We'll just take a look at this one, then we'll move to the next one. You can switch between talk about this one and close it. How do I close this? I'll actually just click on the arrow. The arrow. Oh, there you go. Cool. <clears throat> These two arrows look so good. Mm -hmm. uh, uh. Back. There you go. Cool. All right. It looks like each time I'll have to zoom it up big. That's not a problem. Okay. You might, if you drop down uh, that little rectangle, that little triangle by your. Um, uh, where the zoom button is, there's a little uh, arrow pointed down. If you click on there, it might actually say fit to screen or something. Yeah, fit image in, uh, to window. There you go. Cool. All right. Hey. Okay. Very cool. So let me ask you, is that brush or a knife? Brush. Big brushes. Big brushes. All right. So um, that's going to be uh, hopefully my only painting question I ask you. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I, I can answer painting questions. <laughs> You're going to hear a lot um, of, we have a lot of mottos at the, at the academy. One of them that was created by Martin was message over medium. So our conversations are always going to be about the message. And the message okay. is what you say and how you say it. And the medium is how you actually ultimately execute it. You know, your style, mm -hmm. um, the medium that you use. Okay. So um, I take great pride in, uh, years ago, I had these uh, two schools approach me to basically like revamp their entire 12 to, I mean, uh, K to 12 art program. Uh -huh. But I, I'm not an art teacher, you know, like a trained art teacher. Uh, mm -hmm. And I couldn't really figure out how, how to do this in that system, right? Uh, because you had students that were all these different grades and, and everything builds on top of it, on top of each other. So I could only create a system that if you started in, you know, kindergarten that, and you went through, you could do it. But if you right. started somewhere in the middle, it'd be like, you know. Uh -huh. And so what I realized is I had to create a system that was more of a module that, um, you can take and like attach to an edge an already uh, a system that's already in place. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, which is more my personality. And it also goes with my vision of not changing an artist's style or their medium, but just teaching them really how to see and think clearer. Okay. Um, and so I, I, I for me, it's like a little pride thing that I have where it's like, I don't want to change your style. Now, the reality is it will change a little bit because mm -hmm. you're thinking differently. But in essence, it's the same thing. You still have your style, your medium, mm -hmm. <clears throat> your approach. Um, you know, for example, like when I met Bill, Bill wanted, you know, his work to be unique and this and that. And so he put like gold paint in there and like, yeah, you know, all these little gimmicks, you know, to try to make it valuable. And the more he focused on composition, he realized, wow, I can just edit out all that nonsense and just let the work stand on its own. 
you know. Um, now, you guys are more traditional painters, so you're not really um, doing those kinds of uh, things, you know. Right. Uh, let's, let's crush up seashells and make the beach texturize or something. <laughs> <clears throat> Actually, I, I want to add, um, does some really great abstract pieces. I say Deb actually does some really great abstract pieces. Yeah? Cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm, lo I'm looking forward to getting a little crew of abstract artists here. So maybe you can help kind of, I know Cheryl uh, on Tuesday mornings, she wants to get into more uh, abstract figurative work. Um, okay. And what we teach is we actually teach you how to be an abstract artist is really what composition boils down to. Right. Um, is really, you know, for me, abstract art and representational art, <clears throat> it's kind of like abstract art is focused purely on spirit, representational is focused purely on body, and maybe like your impressionist in between there are kind of the metaphysical people where there's enough representation, but they're really trying to capture the essence of something or mm -hmm. like, you know, light or whatever. Right. Um, and, uh, and when we're dealing with representational artists, when we get them to really focus on trying to capture the spirit of a piece, you know, at least in the beginning part of the process, you become very abstract, you know, um, mm -hmm just like with a portrait, you know, it's not eyeballs, teeth and hair that we're doing. We're trying to capture, are they a dominant energy? You know, are they, uh, are they um, more of an aggressive personality type? Are they more of a receiver? Are they more gentle? Are they more peaceful? Are they more, you know, who, who is this being that you're, you're painting and then using line space and value, what combination of those three things are going to broadcast or evoke that that nature so when you look at a portrait you don't want people to say oh well well that looks like the person you want to you want them to feel like wow when i'm standing in in the presence of this portrait i feel like i'm standing in the presence of that person right mm -hmm. right so i don't know if you guys were there or not when we were talking about it but we were talking about um spit and image Are you guys there I don't think so. Ooh. Well, let me take a minute and share that idea with you. <laughs> okay. If you, if you, if you want, want it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> twisting my arm. Um, okay. I'll twist. <laughs> in the South, we have this, this uh, saying called spit and image. Okay. I always thought it meant that somebody spit, you know, but where it comes from, well, they'll say like, you know, oh man, that, that boy is a spitting image of his dad, right? And what okay. it means is, it, it actually is a, a shorter version of meaning spirit and image. So it means that he looks like his dad and he also, the presence of him, he feels as if he, you were in the presence of that, that guy's father, right? Okay, right. And that's what we want to try to, that's what we want our um, portraits to be. Or if you're in an environment, you want the spit and image, you want the spirit and the image. So it's not good enough just to have someone say, oh, it looks like the person, right? Right. You want them to say, wow, it feels like that person, you know? Mm -hmm. That's how you capture that soul and that spirit. And it's not difficult to do that when you start combining line and space and values. Mm -hmm. okay? So if the person is, let's say, a very energetic person, would you have a lot of lines together or would you have them, you know, spread out from each other? I think spread out because that'd be energy going in a lot of different directions. Yeah. And in, and by having this spread out part, it creates space between the lines, which gives you more of, um, <clears throat> well, hold on. Actually, no, let me go back. If the person's a very energetic person, um, you probably want to have your lines closer so that you would see line space, line space. You're, you're, you would get a lot of visual information, right? Okay. Now, if it's very ordered, so that could be an energetic, uh, orderly person, or if they're more of like 
probably what you were picturing in terms of energetic, you might do a whole bunch of different angles, right? So now your eyes are angles all over the place. Yeah. Now, if they're spread out, see, when when your eye sees a mark, it's like hearing a note on a on a piano. Bing, right? Mm-hmm. And if I go bing 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 bing, that's a lot of energy. But if I go bing bing, right? That's mm-hmm. that's not that's kind of like a chill person, right? <laughs> okay. And so imagine you're painting a person who everybody knows is this very energetic sports kind of guy or whatever, and you have him sitting there and your lines and your space and your values are organized in such a way that he just seems really peaceful. It looks like him, but it just doesn't feel like him. You, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't know, and I'm sure there's portrait classes out there that approach it from that perspective, but I, I, I'm not... Um, I'm not familiar with them. I've never heard anyone talk about it in that way. Most most places are just focused on copying what they see. Mm -hmm. You don't think like a composer. Right. So that's one of our other mottos. Stop copying, start composing. (laughs) I agree. And then I I, I dealt with a couple artists who were really struggling with photography. Um, They would just copy the photos that they would take. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we came up with a, a slogan called F the photo. <laughs> and it just, some, you know, it was like this little mantra. Uh, I started it with John and he loved it. It set him free because he just, every time he would go to draw, he would just scream at, scream that at the photo. Um, the full word version of it. Um, right, right. And it would just set the tone. Like I am the artist, not you. Photo, uh-huh. you know you're not the composer i'm the composer i'm the one in control here you know i'm not a slave to the mm-hmm. photo and uh <laughs> was, that was a pretty neat little breakthrough that we had I'm like john just try just try this yell out the photo <laughs> real quick <laughs> so i'm curious when he was able to get away from it did his work look a oh. whole lot different well, it doesn't necessarily look, but it does feel, right? Because okay. now he's, he's, he realized, oh, I can take out that horrible stop sign that doesn't do anything to the piece, but I was a okay. slave before to keeping it there. Mm-hmm. You know? and, okay. uh, that and makes sense. Was, yeah, and then, you know, his, his wife took really nice photos. And it was interesting, the photos that she would take, he would sell pa- paintings like that. And I said to him, I said, John, you know, maybe you just need your wife to take the photo. You know, obviously, she has like a better knack at composing. And wow. um, Interesting. But he didn't like that idea. It has to be me. So his, uh, his work has, has really, really improved just in terms of the storytelling and, um, and kind of getting away from, like his style is exactly the same, right? Mm-hmm. But he just has more freedom to make the image what he wants it to be than to okay. just be a copier of a photo that he took, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, so what's the story behind this, this uh, painting or this experience? Well, this is a sunset up on Beaver Island, which is an island out in the middle of Lake Michigan. Mm-hmm. And I, the lake as huge as it is, can sometimes be quite flat. And it was one of those nights where it was very flat. And what I was taken with was the reflection and just the huge sky. And so that's what I painted, but it's not telling a story. Or I, I really kind of hit a stop. Mm-hmm. This is where I've ended up with. There's a lot of marsh type mm-hmm. grasses growing out All into right. the water. We're gonna, we're gonna stop you there, okay? Okay. Um, let me get my annotation tool. So again, when you explain what you, what you were trying to do, you said there's huge sky and Mm -hmm. there's a, there's a reflection. Yep. All of that is noun, right? Sky reflection. Okay. Uh, Then you went on marsh, right? Which Mm -hmm. you have to have those in there. Yeah. 
but there was no verb. There was no relationship between the sky and the reflection. There was no relationship between the reflection and the marsh or the marsh and the sky. Okay. Um, and so that's where we want to figure out, that's where we're going to compose is the relationship between the two. Mm. So okay. when you said, for example, that the sun is setting, <clears throat> yeah. if we want you to feel that the sun is setting, then the question is, uh, do we want to move the eye upward or downward? Well, that's a good question because as the sun sets, it, there's so much action going up in the clouds above the sunset that I guess that I'm always attracted to. And that's why I usually I, you never ever see a ball, a yellow ball in my paintings. It's more like what's being affected by the sun setting. Okay. Now that doesn't answer my question. Okay. <laughs> If you want to make the, someone feel the sun is setting, do you want to m make their eye move upward or downward? I guess downward. Because it's setting, right? Okay. Now, the other stuff that you're saying, which is absolutely important, we need to ask other questions for that, okay? Okay. But if you want... The, the key here is that the sun is setting. That's why you have this big sky and the re reflection, right? I mean, that's what's connecting the sky to the earth is. Right. And you don't need to put a ball here. I'm just putting it here right now so we can see, right? So mm -hmm. ultimately, what needs to ultimately happen is something has to come in and connect so that your eye, you see how now your eye just moves down because there's right. a connection? Yeah. Here, what you've created is a barrier. So the eye doesn't flow down into the reflection, causing the eye to move down. It, it, you created a block. Okay. Now the eye moves over to the side. Yeah. So <clears throat> when you said this is a reflection, unless I know representationally what a, re, uh, a reflection, you said this is a sunset. Unless I know representationally what a sunset feels like, I mm -hmm. honestly have no, I, I, I had no idea this was a sunset. Okay. Okay. Because for me, it was about the opening of the sky because that's what your design is saying. Okay. You know, you have this beautiful energy going up in here and then it ends. Um, hold on a second. Clear all this. So you have this beautiful energy coming up in here like this. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, then you have that. So th there's really nothing that moves us from the sky downward. Okay. That makes sense. So by putting this in here, do you see how just putting those two little lines it now draws us down? Yes. I so do. now if you look at that and you say, well, is the sun setting or is it rising? Well... Yep more towards the setting exactly because now now it's moving literally our eye and our head downward now if you want to bring the eye back up after we realize oh the sun is setting well then you come in and you could use this curve that you have here and and bring it back up in here now this line on the side obviously wouldn't exist but your eye would this is called an enclosure you learn this in the in the line strategies It'll bring you back up through here. Okay. And now what's going on down here connects you back up here. Okay. So mm -hmm. we have you, the, the, the initial feeling because the eye will always start in the top right-hand corner, uh, top left-hand corner, because that's okay. who we're trained to read. So we start up there. So you capture mm -hmm. the eye, you bring him through the sky, you set him, and then you bring him back up through here so that they can really begin to feel the energy of that sky again. Okay. And then maybe instead of coming with the horizontal, you could keep this horizontal here, which then pushes the eye into this direction to get caught in this curve, mm -hmm. which brings you back up here. Or you could curve this down here and then bring you back up through here as well. So there's a couple different possibilities there. Okay. 
What are your thoughts there, Barb? Sorry, I had myself muted so you wouldn't hear all my background noises from my dogs. Um, I, I'm curious about one thing. I'm seeing everything that you are, are saying and doing here. Um, but now, um, initially, uh, what I was seeing was all of the, um, all of the movement was happening on the right hand side of the canvas. Is that a problem? Is, is there some um, element that should also move you at least ever so briefly over into the left hand side or does that not matter? I'm thinking more towards the bottom. It's like you come in at the left but then you go to the center and then you show um, you going to the right and up and around and back to the right again and it's like this bottom left hand corner is being ignored. This corner here? Yes. It depends. Um, <clears throat> if we design on a Baroque, I mean on a sinister diagonal, okay, um, then we're not going to focus on this, but if we focus on this, if you want to make it like this little sacred secretive moment, then you're probably right on the idea of flipping, flipping this energy over here, spending it more, more, more of it over here. Okay. Um, I'm fine with the way it is right now because ultimately it's, it's not about the marsh. It's really about the sky. Um, but if you flip that, let's see here. Yeah. I mean, if you flip that, it's going to make you feel like you're kind of standing here and, and looking out onto this, uh, out into the ocean, I mean, the water and the, and the sky. So if you can just imagine all of this flip the other way, you know. Um, oh, now, where the land would be on the other side. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. If you want, I can... Let me take a screenshot of this and I'll bring it into Photoshop real quick and, um, and flip it so we can see what that would look like. Uh, let me see here. Mm -hmm. uh, let me, uh, there he is. Screenshots uh, one thirty. Okay, and let me share my screen. Boop, 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 boop. Okay, do you see that? You guys see that on the screen? Okay. Yeah, my image, yeah. Okay, cool. So what we can do is flip this here. Let's get a little bit more of that at the top there. Um, And then, okay. Yeah, that, that changes that image a lot. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, am I, yeah. I, I almost, what I'm seeing when it's flipped like this, you were talking about that sinister angle, mm -hmm. and, um, that almost that sort of sense of mystery. Mm -hmm. To me, it's stronger when it is flipped this way. And maybe it's because I feel like um, it's, it's wanting to kind of tuck me into this little corner. Yep. Yep. Or draw me in it. It feels, it feels almost secluded and mysterious. So, it, you know, it depends on the feeling. Oh, interesting. So you're saying that by having it in this format, it feels more secluded and mysterious. It resonates better? It, it does to me. Yeah, and, and the reason why is because um, you you see how this um, – hold on. Do you see how this, 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 this dot here comes through here? It kind of begins to repeat this angle coming through. Okay. You, you see that flow? So this angle is what we call a sinister. Now, if it was the other way, let's say if we took the entire piece, right, or let's say – well, this new piece, right? And we flipped the entire thing um, so that the angles were going the other way. Like, that's much more, it's kind of like bringing you in. Okay, so now we have, and this is what we call the Baroque angles. So these are coming all the way through here. And that draws you in and kind of welcomes you in. It opens it up. So what happens here is like, as you move from here down, okay, you're mm -hmm. seeing the entire image. There's really not any part of the image that you don't see. Um, right. This way, because you're being dragged down very quickly from here down to here, you, you, you really are only seeing about half the image. Okay? So hmm. now, in this design, it's interesting because you could you could do this ah not that <laughs> um let's say we have this here oops well i guess we could just do this and then let's flip this on top wow that's kind of cool actually <laughs> Um, gives you that little beat, you know, that little marsh, yeah. and then there's something over there. So now you kind of feel like you're tucked in. But having this um, sky up on that Baroque, which is inviting an opening, and then the where you are in the land mass. Um, so this would be your Baroque, and then down here you're dealing with the sinister. Um, and then if we get rid of that, oh, I kind of like that a lot better. So now that sky feels like it's open, it's wide, it's inviting you in. And when you're on the ground, it feels like it's tucking you in and more secluded and, and you're in this little space. Hmm. Okay. Let's, let's see here. So that was, this is the original. Mm-hmm. It's, now everything's kind of coming over to this little area, right? So your eyes... Right tucking over here now this one it comes over on a sinister so now the sky is still secretive and then the bottom is his sinister so that's complete sinister here we have an open sky I mean, you feel the difference in that right bam right oh i also noticed something here real quick um we there Kind of looks neat without it, though. <laughs> um, but, okay, so this is the original. Then we flip the bottom. So that now gives us a sinister mm -hmm. top and a sinister bottom. It, now this one has a sinister bottom, but a, but a Baroque top, right? So do you see also, by doing this, when your eye comes up, 
and it comes up into the sky, it, it stops here. It's kind of like, it's almost hitting a ceiling, right? Okay. Because you have all of this, this mass here. So it's boop, it hits there. Okay. Um, with this one, it doesn't do that. So as your eye moves up, it then, it judos it, right? It goes with the flow. It kind of okay. encourages it to move, keeps moving. Uh-huh. So there's the difference. Boom. Boom. That, does, that, does that feel more open to you, or does this one feel, feel more open to you? Actually, you know what I'll do? Why don't I put them both side by side, okay? Okay. The wonders of the computer. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. <clears throat> oh, oh, what happened there? That's no blood, huh? Um, hmm. Oh, okay. I think I see what's going to happen here. Huh. Oh. Okay. All right. So there we are. I think the one on the right, I feel like I'm going into the corner and then back out again. It feels more spacious. Is that how it reads to you guys? Oh, this one here? Yeah. Okay. So you're saying that, um, what, which corner? Going out that way up to that upper right. Yeah. Okay. That's what I'm feeling. And then this is like that, and then probably back down. Yeah. So, so I'm thinking one, about... Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, just a question in our very first meetup about the idea of if you were feeling shame and you'd look down, which way would you look, right or left? Uh huh. I was the one who looked left. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting the sense that maybe I don't quite see things like other people do. Um. Well, in this case, uh, Barb, do you agree that the one on the right feels much more open than the one on the left? Yes, it yeah. definitely does. The one on the left, it's like you are um, just tucked in and staying in that little cove. Um, the one on the right, um, yeah, I'm able to kind of move out and, and almost as if I want to just keep on going to infinity. Yep. So if you look at what's happening here, right, uh, this bottom line is the same, okay? Okay. It's moving us in that direction, okay? But what happens here is then it's repeated up here, and it gives us this little, this little, this little space, you know, and it's kind of almost divided th there, except that it goes across there, right? So it's almost uh -huh. like it gives us this little box that we're really focusing on. There's a, a bottom, a top, and then we're kind of wedged into this little space, here, that's that's the box that you're looking at. Okay. So, I mean, do you see how like these little visual elements are either opening up the space or or closing right. it? Yeah. And so, if the idea was, you know, that you're in this little moment, this little special moment, and you're looking at the sky and the sky is opening up, well, we now know, you know anyone with a half a brain cell would look at that and say, oh, well, this one over here on the right opens it up, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that, and I don't mean that in a, you know, I, don't, I know it sounds kind of bad, but, um, but I say it that way because you want people to read it or experience what it is that you're trying to communicate, right? Right. Um, 
And so seeing that now we now you know well this this has to be the direction. Now if if it was a different story, you know, that the sky was, you know, coming over the, the lake and, and it was just like it felt like the world was kind of closing in. Not that it was a bad way, you know, you make it beautiful if it was a beautiful feeling, but like everything was just kind of you know, I was part of this little environment, right? And I was as big as it and it was as, you know, deep as me and all that, whatever, right? Very introspective type of experience. Then you okay. might want to the one on the left because it's going to make people feel like they're, they're more, that more int introspective feel to it. The, that, okay. that extrovert feel like it's more opening up or more intimate, yes. Um, I'm well, a man that those words don't roll off my tongue like that. Um, <laughs> but, but that makes sense to me because I think my experience of nature tends to be more introverted than extroverted. So I find myself leaning more towards the one on the left as a comfort zone versus the one on the right. And, and, that's, and, and that's perfectly fine because you can see when you design with intention, people can say, oh man, I love Deborah's, uh, you know, um, water paintings because even though there's so much sky and so much water and, and, and what I'm looking at is open, I always feel like I'm just, you know, like in this little private intimate moment, even though I'm in the middle of all this vastness. I mean, that's a very profound thing, right? It's like, you're floating, you're like okay. in the middle of all of this space, yeah. and yet you feel very safe with inside yourself, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that can be part, quote unquote, of your style, you know, um, of, of who you are as a communicator. And, um, you know, some people want, want to, exp you know, okay. express certain certain other things. But if that's what you want to express and that's important to you, well, then... Now you know what you, you, you don't want to do is you don't want to have this type of feel, which is opening. Well, what's interesting is I guess getting a sense of it, also knowing if I wanted to express something different, where I would go with that. Exactly. Yep. So like in this case here, what I would encourage you to do is then take this, and you see how it's kind of naturally curving up here? I would then force it up. Okay. Um, uh huh. Breaking okay. um, this field coming across. Okay. So let's see what that would look like. Um, maybe what we could do. Let's just take. Um, You see how something like that now, I mean, that's pretty dramatic, obviously, but right. um, but you can begin to see how now you have some, a little bit more control over things. Um, yeah. I mean, that sky is opening up, right? I mean, right. You know, the fact that that sky is opening up and your eye is now dramatically shooting upward instead of downward, does that feel like a sunset to you? No. Not, not at all. Upwards. Now, what's interesting is this. We have not changed your values or your colors, and now it, it totally does not feel like a sunset. Right. So what's making it feel like a sunset? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The colors help, um, obviously, but you want to really be able to figure out how to move the eye in such a way that it triggers something moving down if the sunset is that important in the image. Maybe it's not. Hmm. That's a good question. Is it that important or is it that sense of what it, that big sky again, 
with what happens with the clouds. Hmm. And you can see how you look at these shapes, how this is going to totally help your abstractions. Oh, we're, yeah. just, we're, just, we're just designing an abstract painting. And then all you're doing is kind of cloaking it in context, right? And the, and the more clear the context is, AKA the subject, mm -hmm. the more representational it becomes, the less um, need for the quote unquote context, the, le the more abstract it becomes. Okay, yeah. And, and, you know, and then you're going to deal with this issue where as you go through this, you become hypersensitive to it. And then there will be an audience that becomes very sensitive to it, right? They'll see it, they'll feel it. Um, and then there will be some who are not really feelers. Uh huh. And they're just not going to feel it. They're not going to get it. And that's okay because you're not painting for every single person just because they have eyeballs doesn't mean that this is for them, you know? Right. You know, I like romantic comedies. I can't stand horror movies. My ex-wife yeah. loves horror movies. Um, and yet we, <laughs> I would never, she would, she would have to go with her sister or her brother to watch them. I was like, I'm sorry. I, I can't afford to have images like that in my imagination. Um, yeah. I feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, it, you know, and just realizing that it's just like, oh, okay, the, you know, they're, they're, the more abstract you're going to go, uh, there are going to be people who love your work and they might not, quote unquote, get it, right? Um, uh -huh. And that's fine because now you're, if you're going to go more abstract, you're going to acquire, you know, you're going to touch a different market um, of people. But um, That's true. So I have to ask you, I just have my painting on the screen and I don't see you guys. Is that what you guys have? Yeah. Okay. Well, I can see you up in the corner. I've got your little corner images. Can't you? I don't see you guys. No. I just think my... it's in the right hand corner. There's like a little button that says like, um, like full screen or something. If you click off the full screen version, I think it will go back and you'll see us. I don't see you guys because I have you oh, guys. Oh, there it is. Okay, cool. Now, now, okay. So, I guess that I, what I'd like to understand is what makes putting all the weight going off to the left more successful than, say, having it, the angle going off to the right in this picture. Why is the right one working better than the left one? No, in this is the flipped version of my original, mm -hmm. and why does the flipped version work better? Oh, okay. Why, why does um, um what you're asking why your original didn't work as well? Right. All right. Well, let's go back to it then. Because that will help me understand yep. more what's going on. Okay. So this is your original. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me walk you through the, um, the thrust map. Okay. Okay. And, and that will answer uh, the question. I'm not sure you watched the thrust map video yet or have you? I have not. Okay. So that one actually is in the bonus videos. Um, okay. so I would really encourage you guys to watch that one probably first. Uh, if you know, you don't have to, but. Um, okay. In this story, I think we start touching on it or something, um, but I leave it out of the story video because uh, when I recorded the story videos, uh, the people who came into that um, that class, they already had the the thrust map video, so I didn't okay. go over it again. Um, but it's it's in that story section. It's just in the bonus videos. Okay. So the thrust map. Um, are five thrusts and, and a thrust is any, is any basically alignment that moves your eye from one place to another. Okay. So it can actually be a line or it can be an alignment. 
It could be a series of, of lines like this. So it's almost like there's a space that's moving you through. Um, so we're not really necessarily looking for a sharp line, although in this case, if we ask, well, what is your dominant horizontal, right? What is the part of this image um, when it comes to a horizontal becomes the dominant, becomes the strongest, becomes the biggest, the clearest? Where would that be? And well, if, I th think it's the, the land on the right at the, at the horizon. The horizon line here? Yeah. Yeah. It would be this, this entire element. Okay. Yeah. Um, now I'm going to go here like, like this. Okay. So, um, so that, and then what we do is we mark it with a DH. Okay. For dominant horizontal. Um, in terms of a diagonal, where would be your dominant diagonal? I think from the lower left corner going up to the right at the horizon line. Like, like this? Yep. Okay. Yeah. And so in this case, it's not like a really clear line per se, but it's just kind of like that thrust, right? Right. Okay. So then we put a DD. And it goes actually through there. Um, and the now, D, D stands for what? Dominant diagonal? D dominant diagonal, yep. Now your DC, which would be your dominant curve. Let's uh, see. Let's give this one to Barb. Barb, where, when you're looking at uh, Deborah's image, where do you think the dominant curve would be? Um, well, the first thing that my eye catches is where uh, on the right hand um, area where the clouds um, come down and yes, right there. Okay. So really, it could even be this entire curve, this, right? Something yes. like that. And would you agree with that, Deborah? Actually, I was thinking the dominant one was the top line of the dark clouds over the horizon, kind of making a, a slight bowl that goes from the left side to the right side, just above okay. the horizon. No, closer to the horizon, where the oh. dark clouds oh, are. Oh, oh, the one in the bottom here. Yeah, to me, that was a dominant line. That's how I was seeing it. I would probably agree with you. Um, sorry, Wildflower. <laughs> um, and, but this is why. But this is why. Um, this is very strong, okay? But visually, because of the higher contrast of this dark to this light, this becomes more dominant. So if you squint your eyes, Barb, like squint them, all of a sudden that curve that you were looking at almost disappears, right? And then this one really hits. Okay. And so, um, like we always say, we want the carrying power. We want to be able to see what, what, where is that dominant curve when you're looking at the image from across the room? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And the contrast is what, what does that. Now, in reality, your dominant curve is, you know, is probably a combination of both. Um, and I'm not just trying to be a peacemaker here, but really it's kind of like that, you know, it's, it's. You just like kind of, that better than me. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> um, so, so we'll say that we'll, we'll just keep it at that bottom one here. Okay. Uh, either way, the dominant curve doesn't interact with with the dominant horizontal or the dominant diagonal. Okay. Right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's basically this, this energy that's up in the top part of the sky, you know, up in the sky. Okay. Um, so so we'll, we'll, let's go ahead and label that dominant. Now we'll call it a, a, dom, a, a, we'll call it a DA for dominant arc, okay? Even though oftentimes I'll call it a, 
a curve. Okay. But we use DC for d dominant contrast, which we'll get at, uh, get to at the, um, but let's go ahead and do that. Actually, right now, where is your dominant contrast? Where is the darkest dark and the lightest light in this image? I think it's in the foreground in like kind of a, in the middle of the marsh stuff where you've got the strong diagonal, broken diagonal dark line and then kind of a oval shape of brilliant lighter value. Yep. Like right, right in there? Actually, a larger area that, that kind of diagonally oval shape that, that crosses like an X crosses the dominant line. Or the dominant diagonal. It's almost like another diagonal that's light. All right, let's do this. Um, on your computer, um, at the top, you'll see a bar, and then there's like these little three dots. It might say options. Um, it has opacity and flow, and oh, I see the little options. Okay. Well, I'm talking about on your Zoom. On I Zoom. found it. Okay, and then there's a, a thing that says uh, annotations. Or annotate. Okay. So click yeah. on that and then you can click the little draw button and you can draw right on your screen and you can point it out. Or you can use an arrow or something. One of the tools is there. Okay. Okay. Look at that. Oh, I see. I have to erase that. Okay. Cool. So now, uh, Deborah, did, did you draw that in blue? Yeah. All right. So first of all, in an image this big, you, 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 your dominant contrast should almost never, ever, ever, ever be that big. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, it becomes just like a, a point um, because if the dominant contrast is that large, and I don't like to make rules because depending on the design or the point of the image, it could, it could possibly be very large, but most of the time it's not going to be that large because um, on a scale, when we do value, we do, we do values between a scale of zero and nine. Okay. Mm -hmm. So okay. basically we're going to put zero, the highest point of contrast is going to be your lightest light and your darkest dark in the image. Okay. And that's going to be a, a certain little area. Now, it may radiate out, and it might go from a 9 and a 0 range, let's say a 9 and a 0, right? Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's say 9 and 0, okay? And as it goes, as it expands out, right, let's say you have this element that's a 9, and now we put the 0 here. Well, this might be a one, this might be a two, and this might be a one. And so therefore you can already begin to see how this maybe might be white. This might be like just a tone different, you know, one tone different, two tones different. But next to this nine, this little area right here becomes the highest point of contrast. Even okay. though this whole area is light with a dark area, just like you have here. Mm -hmm. um, but it's clear to me, like, let's say this was... Uh, an eight value. This might be a three. This might be a two. Okay. Okay. Uh, for me, like this little area right here is probably your dominant contrast because that's almost, you could almost imagine that being almost like a one, almost just a little thin line right back there. Oh, uh, okay. You know, and, and you can already begin to see how like, um, can you take the blue off? I think that it'll allow you just to kind of either erase it or click the trash can. There you go. Cool. So let's just like take this for a minute and oops. Now the only problem is we have this line down here at the bottom there. Do you see how just that little tiny shift in value, it brings the eye all the way back there? Yes. I mean, you know, there it is now. Yeah. Boom. 
And so that's what we're looking for. So now why that's important in this image is because now we have a dominant contrast, let's say here. And what we do is we create a little shape like this, a little box where half of it's black, half of it's white. Okay. Right. And we put that in the area of the dominant contrast. So that's four major thrusts. Now intuitively, you're kind of bringing everything over to this little area with this little marsh thing in the back, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, question, the next question is your dominant vertical. Your dominant vertical is your highest vertical. Okay, so where in this image would, would your dominant vertical be? And you can use your annotation tools if you want to play around with it. I really don't know. It's, it's kind of a tricky one. Um, any idea, Barb? Other than you know the small verticals that are happening with the um, the shapes of the trees and the grass, as far as a larger mass or area, no, I'm not seeing it. All right. So what I would say is from here, you got this coming down through. This is kind of popping up, right? It's like a little vertical thrust. These are all vertical thrusts as well. But the difference here is that this just comes to kind of like here, right? I mean, it just kind of like falls, falls into this thing. But here, this kind of comes down and begins to connect. And then you can even kind of even see a little bit of a, of a little vertical in here. So this is kind of giving you this little thrust, right? So here, it's only going to go to there. Uh, you could, you know, this is basically feels like it's going to end there, right? So here, it's pretty low. It's here. And then if you went higher... Now, if you were doing this intentionally, right, you could say this is your dominant vertical, and then what you could do is bring like this little mass here, shift it over so that it lands here, okay? Like the, the clouds that are here, get rid of them, right? So that it lands on that vertical, right? Okay. So you're having all these little nuances that are giving you this vertical thrust. Okay. Uh -huh. um, so what's happening here is you're converging four dominant uh, thrusts in one location, and then your curve is up here. And that's really, really good. If you want ultimate clarity, you, you want to align all five. Oh. Okay. If you want, um, so for example, you could have in this image, if you wanted to design it like this, uh, let, let, let me get rid of this uh, line here at the bottom. It's really annoying my OCD. Um, <laughs> so what we could do is, uh, is say, okay, we're going to put dominant horizontal here. We're going to make this section, oopsie, the dominant vertical. Okay, and again, you start aligning things up along it to kind of make these alignments that captures the eye. So this little thing you might bring on this side or, or keep it open or whatever, okay? So now that gets us two. Um, and then we could put the dominant contrast in there as well, okay? So that gives us a, a DV, a DH, and a DC. Now, Let's imagine we take all of this out. Okay. Oopsie. Come on. Do as I wish, <laughs> computer. Okay. So let's imagine we take all of that out. Boom. Okay. And... We add like a little curve in there, okay? 
Okay. Now, what, what we can do is maybe in the designing part of it, we say, okay, what we want to do is, um, how do I want to do that? Okay, let's say we want to make this, the sky a Baroque. Right now it's a sinister, right? So, mm -hmm. oh, actually, you know what? Let's just go ahead and do that. Because what I'm trying to get to is um, this idea that if we have the sky separate, uh, here we are, good. Okay, and then let's get this little elements back in there. Okay, so now what we can do is say, this becomes our dominant per, um, diagonal. Okay. And this becomes our dominant curve. You could actually do a little, maybe figure eight, so that when, you, when you're up in the sky, right, and then what you can do is you start just manipulating this cloud so that it mimics this, this, this curve. So that instead of making the clouds go straight across here, you might brush them a little bit more like this. Okay, instead of going across, you might bring them in. Okay, so that it kind of mimics mimics that feel. So when you're looking at that sky, all of a sudden it just has this different energy. It's just like this: your eye is just moving in this figure eight kind of format. It's radiating out this energy, right? Yeah. With this really strong diagonal going up through it which is inviting you into this space. Um, now down here, so now you have two, right? You have this dominant, uh, um, dominant arc, you have the dominant diagonal. Your dominant contrast, your dominant vertical, and your dominant horizontal are down here. This is where they converge. What's also nice is I like the fact that they kind of converge here, um, up here on that, on that dominant vertical. So. Is that making any sense? Yeah. Okay. So it just gives you a, a real quick way of answering these five questions all the way in the beginning. And it, and it allows you to take your story and begin to compose out the, the major um, thrusts in your image. And then from there, you can say, okay, well, I'm doing an ocean scene. Let this dominant horizontal be my horizon line, right? Um, okay. I could have the edge of a cliff here if I want, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the clouds are up here and, and they're coming up here. And then, so anything in this, in this area is going to be sky and then cloud is going to be over here, you know? Mm -hmm. So it just allows you to kind of quickly lay out your image in a way that captures those five elements that people are naturally going to pick up. So, and the reason why they pick it up is because, remember the exercise we did when we had you jump onto the piece of paper? Yeah. It's the same thing. It's like the mind is looking for the longest diagonal. It's looking for the longest, because it's, it's trying to get order. It's trying to understand what it's looking at. And so it's going to start looking for a hierarchy, you know. Uh, where, where's the authority? Where's the leader of the pack? when it comes okay. to the verticals. And, and so you give it, you give them the five chiefs, you know? you know? Okay. Um, let me uh, clarify something for me. Um, did you not say that uh, it's actually best to have all of the points kind of merging at some place? Yeah, I said that, that's for ultimate clarity, right? So, for example, if we were doing an image and this was a lighthouse back here, and maybe you, this is a monument of some sort and you were commissioned to do a lighthouse or whatever, right? Um, and let's say it was at nighttime and there was a light beam coming out. Well, what you would want to do is probably make your dominant contrast this 
and on that horizontal and lower the contrast here so that your dominant horizontal now becomes the beam of light, not the edge of the water, right? right. Okay. But the reason why I'm saying that is because they're very, they're very close, but now you're making a decision on, on using value to, to bring hierarchy to one over the other, making this the dominant, which relates to the lighthouse more, far better than the edge of the water does, right? The beam of light brings clarity to that. So in this case, you could have a dominant vertical. You can have a dominant, horiz I mean, yeah, dominant horizontal. You could have your dominant contrast, okay? Okay. Um, we could also, if, if it, the story is about the lighthouse, we could have our dominant diagonal coming there and, and maybe having a dominant curve, you know. Um, another dominant curve could actually be the light kind of radiating out, you know, and maybe up on the clouds, it would be light up underneath here. So now, no matter where you're looking, your eye is either going to come back to the lighthouse or, in this case, the sky is being affected by the lighthouse, right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of neat. <laughs> um, and so now all five elements are bringing clarity that this picture is not about the sky, it's not about the water, it's not about, you know, the snails that live in the marsh, it is about the lighthouse. Okay. Okay. Now... If the lighthouse has a beam of light shooting out this way, the question then is, because the lighthouse is over here and, and our eye is traveling along, the, along this way, is this lighthouse um, calling out to you or are you coming to it? You're coming to it. Exactly. Now let's change that um, let me let's do it this way um, let me flip this is it calling out to you or are you coming to it it's calling out to you exactly two different stories same exact layout just reversed now I have to ask, what makes it calling out to you? Well, because you, we read from left to right. So we don't end here. We start here, and then our eye okay. travels. So it makes our eye and our head move away from the lighthouse, which is going out to you. This one. Okay. You know, we start here, and now we're coming to it. No matter okay. which way we start, we're coming to it. Okay. So if, if it's on the left side, then that's drawing us to the left side. It, we're being drawn into it or? Well, it's a, well uh, the way I look at it is how does your eye move? And when I ask the question, how does your eye move? I always move my head so I can really feel it. Okay. Okay. So if I, if I know I'm starting on the left-hand side and I'm, my head is moving or my eye is moving, if, it, if, if I'm up here, it's moving down right? And okay. on an angle. If it's in the middle here, it's moving across. If it's down here, it's moving up towards it. Ultimately, okay. it comes here. This is where it stops. So my, my eye and my head is coming to the lighthouse, right? Mm -hmm. If it's the okay. other way around, and now it's going away from the uh, lighthouse, either going down into the water, going straight across the ocean, uh, or the water, or going up into the sky, it's going away. And so therefore... Okay. It's not that the lighthouse is broadcasting necessarily. It's the fact that my eye is being pushed away. And so therefore, the, the image is, is moving me in a way that makes me feel that I'm being pushed away. Okay. So. And that ultimately is because we read from left to right. Yeah, and most likely you're not going to be selling to Chinese people, so, <laughs> so who, read, who read the other way, right? So most of us are going to experience it this way. So most people would experience if the lighthouse was on the left, they would be being pushed away by it or drawn into it? 
most people, if the if the lighthouse is on the left, they would it would be they would be pushing away from it. It would be broadcasting. Okay. The three of us looked at it, and we both agree. The three of us agreed that you know we're being drawn to it, right? So when we flipped it, we all agreed that we were being it was being we were being pushed away from it. Correct. Well, I have to say, and it was interesting you brought up about Chinese, because mm -hmm. I'm very, very influenced by Chinese and Japanese artwork. Mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if that's why I see things differently, and, I, and this is new to me, mm -hmm. what you're talking about reading. You know, I, I read a book from left to right, but I don't necessarily look at artwork or images out and around me that way. And I was the one when looking down, I was the one that looked left when everybody else looked right. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that's what's getting in the way here for me is this concept that I'm still trying to get my head around. Do most people find then that the lighthouse would be more desirable on the left? It, it, you can't answer that question unless you know what your story is. Oh, Okay. Yeah, it's, not a, it's not a matter, Deb, of right or wrong. It's a matter of what mood or emotion do you want to create? Do you want to have people coming into your lighthouse? Or do you want to feel as if you are, say, at the lighthouse and you're looking out away from it? Right? Yep. So let's say uh, you have a story of Hansel and Gretel, right? Okay. Are they, are they going to the little cottage, or are they go, or, or are they going from wherever they started? You know, um, it may just be. You know, you might be. Well, let's say Little Red Riding Hood. Okay, she's going through the woods. Okay. Is she going to Grandma's house, or is she leaving where she just came from? Right. So, it depends on what part of the story you're in, and what 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 you're trying to uh, communicate. And then making sure that the way that the people feel is in alignment, in alignment with what's being communicated visually. Um, okay. So you need to you have to you have to be very clear on what it is that you want to tell, and then make sure that the design supports it. Because this is where a lot of people go wrong. You know, they so many times they they want to paint something that's I have a. Um, one of the, the girls at the academy, uh, she's a brilliant painter out of Australia, but for some reason, she just always was designing her images on a sinister. And she, she couldn't understand why people were liking her work, but they were, it wasn't resonating with them, right? And she'd have these scenes where, what was that? I think I may have a similar issue going on that I tend to design it on the sinister. Yeah, and I, and I think part of it is, you know, her personality, uh, I can tell it in you a little bit, not so much in your personality, but in your choices. Um, you take, oh, well, maybe it is your personality. You take great pride in being the artist and being the, the isolated, right? I mean, where you live. Um, the, I don't know if I take pride in it. It's how it is. That's, that's who I am. Yeah, and so therefore, when you're doing the work, you're painting it isolated, right? And that's what the sinister is, right? Um, okay. So it's the introverted personality of the painting. You have to now make this decision. Are you going to be intentional about that and then market to people who feel that, who, who, who are desiring more of that introspective work? Or does your audience desire more extroverted work? Do they want to be drawn into the image? Okay. And I think they desire the extroverted. And what I, was think that? I think the audience does desire the more extroverted. They want to be brought into it, welcomed into it. And I don't think that's one of my strong suits. And, 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 and so one of the, one of the things you can do as um, you know, to kind of learn how to do this, and this is why the meetups are really great because when you start to just, begin to lay out your energy map or your thrust map and getting clear on your concept, you can see how quickly we can just flip things around on the computer. Yeah. And you see the difference. It's like, and then you'll hear the collective gasp of, <gasps> and then everybody's in, in agreement. Right. And you just know uh -huh. you, you hit it, you know? 
So that's where the meetups become really, really super important is like you get to catch these little things all the way in the beginning because it's a matter of design, not a matter of painting. Right. You know, that makes sense. And and that's why I have, I'm sorry, go on. I was thinking that's why this is so interesting that you were able to flip this image and do things with it in a flipped, which I think would be more appealing to most people. And, and you and you got to be careful with that because um, you don't want to just get into the habit of creating artwork for the people, but you have to have some balance where it's like, you know, um, where you're doing your work, your ideas, um, but you're also respecting the fact that it's them who enjoy it and buy it, right? Right. And, and so this and is coming from a place of knowledge about which way you could go with that would be a much stronger position. Yep. And imagine uh, doing a series or collections of images and, and, and you lead them through a journey, you know, you lead them from this, maybe the first two are open images. The third one's a neutral and the last two are very introverted. Right. Um, And you lead them through uh, this collection of images, which is really leading them into this, this journey of, of, of going inside themselves. Okay. You know, so for me, it becomes really, really fun. Yeah. It's, it's all good stuff. (laughs) In in comment to um, Deb's feeling that the market wants a more extroverted painting. I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. I, I think that it's just, um, it's just a matter of which mood you want to put in it that is who you're going to attract to it uh but i think that you're probably going to find a lot of people that love also that more intimate feeling of the more introverted um emotion that is being had so it's really not a, a question of what is right or wrong in my mind it's more a question of what is it that you're trying to say with this individual piece? Yep. And then hopefully you will find the person that will, that will resonate with. Yeah. That can respond to that. Yeah. Yep. And in there, and in every group, you're going to have all of those people, right? So you just, as the, as the composer, because um, we, we don't use the word artist. And so that's a blasphemous word at the Academy. Um, but as the as the composer, uh, you control that. You you you. As the composer, what you want to do is just make sure that the painting has integrity, right? So that who what what you say it is, it is, and what people feel and see, it is, right? Mm-hmm. So that's why you have to be very very clear. That you're just not focused on the nouns. You have a big open sky and uh, a sunset and a reflection. Well, what's the relationship between those three things? Um, One of the things, and you might have gone over this when you were watching the video, is we talk about changing the charge, right? So here's one charge. Here's another charge. Okay. So when when we shifted this image around, like here, uh, let's go here. You know, the reality is because this is here like this and down here it's the same thing. You know, if this is one charge, this really is the same charge, right? Okay. It doesn't really change. But this, that that's one charge. And then you have this. That's a totally different energy, right? Mm-hmm. And so what we tried to do is we tried to change the charge because Rockwell said one of the keys to his success was making people feel two emotions in the same image. I remember you saying that, yeah. And so this doesn't make you feel those two emotions necessarily. This just kind of makes you feel one emotion, which isn't bad. Mm -hmm. The question here is if you can get this charge down here and this charge up here the same, and then maybe really focus on creating a different energy when you're in the inside of here. Well, now you did that. Let's 
see how that works. Uh huh. And so you might keep your dominant horizontal inside here, your dominant curve. So out here, maybe you don't use curves, you just kind of use these horizontals. I mean, these are diagonals. Mm -hmm. um, so you can begin to see there's like a difference just in the energy right. on the outside of that rectangle. I mean, yeah, outside of that, this box, and, and then versus the inside of that. Here, the sky is its own charge and it's opening up. And then this becomes a, a very different energy down here. That makes sense. And I know you like to work big, so this is kind of fun. If you can get some newsprint, uh, uh -huh. where I get my newsprint from is, is, do you guys have like a local uh, newspaper? Not really, not anymore. Oh, darn it. <laughs> well, I know. <laughs> well, well, I if you ever get to the big city or something, um, find the local newspaper. I know I'm lucky right now where, I, where I'm at right now. I'm only about a block and a half away from the newspaper. And, uh, and when they print it, they print it on that newsprint, but they never finish off the rolls. So they just have all of these rolls in the back of the, of the company, and you can just go in and take whatever you want. You know, they just give it away. Um, okay. Because they're going to throw it away. If, you know, so I remember when I was a kid, my mom would uh, go down and get those. And that's where she told us, you know, told me where, where he got it. So I'd get, I'd get it for my kids. And some of the local artists that I work with, they go down there and they just get the big rolls and it's just huge rolls of newsprint, you know. <laughs> and so you can just wow. cut huge sheets. You know, you want six feet, you know, right there it is. Roll it out on the floor and you can do these big, uh, gesture drawings and energy maps and whatever and just have fun with, you know, mm -hmm. big if you want. Um, so, cool? I'll have to search around for that. Okay, cool. Well, I think um, the other image that you have, why don't we keep that one for uh, Sunday? Was okay. That? Um, a Deb, no. I mean, a Deb, uh, Barb, real quick. Um, I know Bill and I and Deb are probably going to be available on Christmas and New Year's. Um, will you be, uh, we, we have a meetup on those days. So um, will you be available on those days or, or are you going to be with family or which? I probably will be available. Um, my family is pretty spread out anymore. So um, I don't foresee that being a problem. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, I probably will be. All right, cool, cool. I know I'm, I was telling uh, Deborah that my, my family, we celebrate Christmas on the 23rd, um, so that on Christmas, since all we're all sons, we can be with our wives' families. Um, and since I ain't got a wife right now, I'm free! No. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I'll be available on Christmas, you know. I normally just go watch a movie and go to eat some Chinese food. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and, and then my, my kids will be with, um, their mom. So I'll be available so we can have a, have our, uh, have our meetup on those days then. Cool. Um, I have a question for you regarding the, um, kind of like the assignments as they may be. Um, I did watch the first story video. Yep. Um, at the end of it, you do sort of give an assignment out. Um, is that where we are at? Is that what we are supposed to do? Or is that just an example of, of where things are, are sort of traveling? Um, the assignment really is uh, first find your collection, right? Determine what your collection is. And then what are the five images that you're going to do inside that collection? And then from there, um, with those five images, you've got to be able to put down, write down what the story is, you know, within one sentence. I challenge you to do it within three words, um, but for each, for each image. So, uh, for example, um, Michelle, she did hers on, she had to do these five images on flags, right? So her collection was flags. Um, and then 
but she didn't want to just paint flags. So the one image was about uh, the way the, what they were was how do the flags make her feel or what does she think about them, right? So one was pride, one was spirit, another one was community, community and so on. Um, so those were the five images. So she actually broke it down really just to one word, which was community, you know, uh, pride, spirit. Um, and so the flags were part of the image, but her, her, the painting really had nothing to do with the flag. It had to do with community. And then she had the flag in the image. Um, and in this case, in the community one, it was really neat because she really focused on drawing an energy. Like when she thought about community, what was that? And she kind of drew this really neat little spiral thing. And that's what the image really became. Um, and then in terms of context, she put it into – well, you know, I, I know it's kind of hard for me. I'm just, t I'm just talking. So let me, uh, let me go grab the image real quick so you can see it. Uh, Michelle. So when we get together on Sunday for the first meetup, mm -hmm. um, are we supposed to bring any images with us or is it just basically a kind of an idea thing at that point? Oh, it's just mainly at that point idea. Um, hold on a second. What I want to see is what, what, what collection are you doing? Okay. Can you guys see, um, I'm probably not. Hold on. Let me just bring up, uh, let me just copy this image. Ooh. All right. Maybe not that. Let's do this. All right, can you see that painting? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So she has the flag in there, but really, mm -hmm. uh, are you really doing this to me now? There yeah. we go. So really, that's really what the image is about. And then her dominant vertical is here, dominant horizontal, dominant contrast is here. Okay. Uh, we even played with the cool and the warms going through here, keeping the flag low because we didn't want it really to be the center of attention. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and so this one sold before she even opened, before the, before the show even opened. And you look at that. When you go back, you see when it gets smaller, you can still see where your dominant contrast is right there. Yeah. You, know? uh -huh. you really, you still feel the energy of that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, um, let me see if there's a, another one here. I think she had another one up here. I think this was the spirit one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's real successful. Yeah, you, know, you can feel this energy moving through through that, um, you know, yeah. and and the spirit coming down from above. I mean, look at like even up through here, you know. Um, and then obviously you have your dominant vertical, <laughs> uh -huh. horizontal, diagonal. Uh, I think this is the, the point of contrast right in there. Um, no, I guess it was here. And, you know, I mean, it, 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 it's working for her. It's... it's it's really, really working for her. And it's kind of freeing her up from, you know, spending too much time on, on these little details that don't mean anything and really just trying to keep focused on getting people to feel, feel these, um, feel, feel her images. Boom. So collection, the five images that go in, in those collections um, and just being able to articulate what, you know, what, what, what each image is, you know? So for example, uh, Barb, in your collection, let's say you want to do um, the beauty of flowers, right? Mm -hmm. So one image you might focus on what makes something pretty. You might have another flower that might be, you know, hot. You know, I don't know. I'm just saying it, you know, um, another one that's, that's elegant, right? 
So yeah, let's just say. Actually, in, in listening to the first story video, um, I, I have to tell you, um, I had a notebook in front of me and all of a sudden it was just kind of all of these ideas started pouring out and I started to really um, get a, a really good uh, what I felt a really good grasp on um, how to convey emotion in my still life florals. Um, Wonderful. Is, yeah, they aren't just uh, about the objects. Each one of them, and even the um, the secondary objects that I use in it, all have really a, a certain um, personality. Mm -hmm. to them that I can deliberately pick and choose to create that particular emotion in a painting that I am wanting to convey. And I've never really approached it that way, at least not, not on a, a, an aware level. Perhaps mm -hmm. on a subconscious level, I did do some of that, but to be able to think in terms of doing that very deliberately is real exciting to me. Awesome. You know, it's funny. I, I didn't know you watched that video yet. And yes. yeah. And, and when you were uh, saying some of the stuff, making some of the comments you were making about the lighthouse, especially, I was like, huh, did, she's getting it. Like I didn't, <laughs> like, I didn't know you had that breakthrough. Cause I know that was the part that you were struggling with, you know, last week or a couple of days ago. And uh, I'm like, huh, what, what, I think she was tricking me. <laughs> she <gets it> all. <laughs> that, that video was a real eye opener for me, and I just I, I loved it. In fact, I called Deb right after watching it, and and I'm sure she was probably just going, "Oh, good grief, Barb, settle down." But I'm just like, yeah. Barb, get my ideas out because um, there there were so many things that started to connect for me in how how my paintings really are not about the subject. Um, so much as they are about how that subject makes me feel and how do I tell that story yes. so that I can get that across to other people. Oh and my God, I, I want to hug you. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> so, polisher. <laughs> I'm so happy for you. Wow. Yeah, yeah I'm very excited about it. And I, I actually started while I was, um, you know, thinking on of I'm, I'm writing all of these ideas down of, you know, like, for example, a rose has a personality to me. A, a rose yep. has, what you were saying, the, the elegance. Um, so if I want to convey something very um, playful or, um, you know, less, less serious, I'm not going to paint a red rose in it. Um, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to see some of those things and how I can use them. So. Yeah, cool. Very yeah. cool. That's cool. Man. <laughs> nice, nice. Um, okay. Well, now she's yes. got... I'm kind of clueless. <laughs> Watch the video, Dad. <laughs> well, I've watched the first hour, but... Um, Watch the other two hours. <laughs> it's like, well, it's I'm, popcorn. I'm going to. Um, yeah, when I'm not cooking or entertaining people. <laughs> um, I guess that my plan is it will be water paintings, but I'm not sure what I should be thinking about as far as a collection. Well, well, let's have a conversation about that. Um, first of all, don't stress out about it, okay? okay. Um, and the reason why is because you got to focus on these commissions. And um, oh, I think you froze there. Oh, there you are. Okay. Um, you got to focus on your commissions. And we're taking – we're officially starting th this process with you and I think Connie in um, – around the middle of, of January. Right. Um, so think about this stuff, but don't get stressed out about it, okay? Uh, okay. But since we have you here, and you, uh, let's just have a conversation about it. Um, let's say you want to do a, a collection on the water paintings, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so what... When you're out there and looking at the water, 
what is the experience like why like when you're driving over there um like what what's exciting you about going there what's inspiring you to 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 get your jacket on and head on over there or whatever it is or maybe you go out in a in a two piece i don't know whatever you know what what what's <laughs> What's making you go over there? I think it's the movement, the patterns. I love the patterns of that I see all the time in nature, but and I'm watching them constantly moving in the water. Mm -hmm. That's what one of the big things that I'm always knocked out about is these patterns in nature that I keep seeing in all kinds of different things. And I see it in the water and I guess with part of what the water intrigue for me too is because it's transparent. It's this, this big mass of stuff. You can see through it. You can see the top of it. Things are reflected off from it and it's moving and has all different kinds of personalities to it. What kind of personalities? Well, there's some very mellow, you know, days of, and then there's the, the big waves and the crashing. So, um, some of the water is very aggressive. Some of it's peaceful. So <clears throat> what I'm happy about this is that you didn't talk about the nouns. <laughs> you talked about... I made a note to myself, lose uh, the nouns. <laughs> well, look at that. Awesome. So you talked about the patterns, right? That's the design. I guess that's um, a noun. <laughs> well, I mean, technically it kind of is, but you weren't like, when I say nouns, I mean, uh, the obvious ones are water, Scott, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But the patterns, at least for me, are, are actually not nouns. Uh, I mean, you could say a frequency is a noun, but it, it, when you say the word, you, don't, you, you can't picture something in your head right? You just, just, that's more of an energy word. It's like, how do you, energy is a noun, but how do you picture energy, right? right. Um, so pattern is very similar to that. It's okay. really an invisible noun, right? It's, it is a thing, but it's something you don't, you can't see. It's something that you perceive, right? Right. Because if you stand there and watch the water, mm -hmm. Well, at least for me, I start seeing the repeating patterns of the movement and it's different every time, yep. but I can watch it and I can start telling you maybe seven rows of waves out, it's going to do a repeat movement and things like that. And that's what I see. And I, I love that. And, and that's when we get, I, to, we get to hug our little rain man inside, you know, or inner <laughs> rain man. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, I mean, you know, I mean, it, 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 it's, I just watched this, cool, well, I shouldn't say that because this is recorded. I saw a movie at some point <clears throat> called The Accountant and uh, with Ben Affleck. And, you know, he was this guy who suffered from this autism and they gave him this ability to see numbers and, and that kind of stuff. And, uh, and really like patterns you know, in things. Um, and, and it was funny because he used these great mathematicians, you know, uh, their names to kind of like as like aliases um, because he, because of the line of work that he was in. Um, but I, I see artists very similar to that, you know, like we have this little, a lot of us have this little um, dysfunction <laughs> so we might see patterns and things and as long as we you know keep a smile on our face we can we can revel in our OCD or our, our little you know <laughs> mental disorders but it's it's our blessing and our curse right and the fact that we can see these things sometimes we see them and we articulate them to people and they don't want us to tell them the patterns right <laughs> it's like you keep doing this over and over again. You know? Right, right. And this is what's going to happen next because this is what keeps being repeated. You know, um, but it's like, but when it when we tap in into it as our uh, as our blessing, well, then that becomes part of our style. It becomes what makes us unique because we can see the things other people can't see, 
And then when you know how to articulate those things through design, well, now you're actually allowing people to feel it and see it. And by showing them, oh, these three elements work together to make you feel that. And then they, they begin to see into this realm that, w- that we live in. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so, you know, embrace it. As a composer, that's what you're putting on paper are those patterns. That's why I talk about space and line. Because what mm-hmm. you see is the ring is a line. The, the time that it goes from one ring to the next in the water, that's the space, right? Now, it's gonna, in the water, I, I missed something. Okay, you said like when you, you see, or like the little wave, right? And then you know seven yeah. waves out, it's going to repeat itself, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So between each little wave, there's a space, Right. And, and they're probably different measurements of space. And then it repeats that, that pattern, that bigger pattern over, you know. Um, mm-hmm. Now, the question is, why does it repeat that pattern? Is there a rock down underneath the ground that the water is hitting that's causing it to pop up in there? Whatever those things are. But um, why is that current moving in that pattern? Uh, I guess my point in, in saying all that is that the little wave that you see and then the time that it takes from that pattern to repeat itself is space. Mm-hmm. So I know most artists never think about space outside of positive or negative, but, but using space as actually something to broadcast a, broadcast a frequency out to the viewer. Um, I, I, I'm not really sure we really think about it like that. Uh, let me show you a painting. Okay. Um, someone posted a painting on Facebook yesterday, and let me just show it to you real quick because I, th- I think it was, oh, where was it? Um, who, wa- uh, who was it? Oh, it was Ed. I think it was Ed. It wasn't Ed. It might have been Mark. Let me see. Because um, when I saw it, I was like, oh, my gosh. And, and it's the spacing of it. That gives, oh yeah, there it is, cool beans. That just gives it this really, really neat. Okay. So you guys see the little Thanksgiving there? That's, I think I lost you guys. Um, do, do you guys see that there? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. I'm sorry, what was that? Yeah. Okay, so, okay, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my tracing paper over top so we can just really like get rid of all the, the colors and, and, and details and just look at the, the, the big general shapes of it. So when I saw this, I was like, oh man, this is cool. And, and when you look at an image like this, there's, um, you realize it's been composed, okay? Mm-hmm. I like the fact that there's like one Indian here. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Um, and so you start reading it as a composer, right? This wasn't just um, intuitively laid out. So in this image, what's happening? What, what is the story? What is it that we're witnessing? Anybody? Well, she's bringing the the bird, and and some people are noticing it. And they're they have all been waiting for it to show up, and so yep. in the center, here she is. Here it is, folks. Yeah. yeah. Now, what's and the verb? Are... I'm sorry. What's the animation that's gonna? Ha- what's happening in in the image then? Like, okay, so that's the noun. Here it is. Yoo-hoo, it's here. Now, who's saying you hoo he- it's here? Me. <laughs> oh, he needed a picture. Barb? I mean, uh, yeah, Barb, what, what are your thoughts? I, I, to me, it's anticipation. That's what I'm getting from it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so so you're, n- neither of you are wrong, right? It, it, it's all of that. Um, and what's 
Now, when I ask about what's the animation, it's like, okay, well, we're looking at the, the nouns. There's this moment, this is anticipation that's going on. They're excited for this, for this, I guess she's bringing the gravy over here. Um, but before they can eat it, what, what, what has to happen? <laughs> they, got, they, they got to put that bird on the table. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's really what this image is about. It's about the animation of walking this bird and then putting it on the table. Because see, what happens here is you have this really dark value shape, right? Right. Why does it happen here, not over here or over here? Because boom. To stop her and bring you down to the table. Exactly. Yeah. And do and you see how it creates this space here? Mm -hmm. Like everybody on this side is leaning this way. Everybody over here, this, this whole element's over here, right? Now, because it's, the designer wants us to get over here, now this image is coming this way. Notice how everybody over here really is kind of leaning us this way because yeah. our eye needs to move this way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now, by having also all of this energy moving us this direction, and then dramatically bringing us down because this is, ugh, you're laying it down on the table, right? right. And she's not going to lay that thing down like a, like a butterfly. It has weight to it, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. So that thing's going to land hard, right? It's not a gentle lay down. Mm -hmm. But what's cool also on top of it is this. And this is where the spacing part comes in. Uh, let me... When we look at this, oh, wait, let me go here. Um, okay, so if we, if we feel her, right, this, the little girl, we can see that she's leaning contrary to where everybody else is leaning, right? And mm -hmm. so, so is the woman, right? She's designed in this energy, which is opposite of where everybody else is. So when your eye yeah. comes in here, now, down here, the dress starts to bring us this direction, right? Which then moves us to the, the, the woman, which then brings us down here, which then moves us in that same direction up through here, which then, when it comes to the same spot, brings us down in here. Do you see the pacing? Yeah. Yes. She's walking. It, it's kind of very much like the Degas painting, where it's using two figures to communicate really this one concept of this person walking with the food, right? Right. So your mm -hmm. eye is feeling this spacing. Boom. Mm -hmm. Boom. Mm -hmm. Oops. Boom. Mm -hmm. Boom, right? I mean, right. I, I, you know, oh, and yeah. when you begin to get really sensitive to seeing it, these images become a whole nother thing than just, a, oh, a nice little Thanksgiving, you know. Like for me, I'm coming into this, this understanding like these old paintings were not about capturing a moment in time. It was, it was much more about how do you create an animation, but within <laughs> one frame, you know. And then they become alive. These images become alive. And it's not about this guy looking at the, the, the turkey. That's just the context. But the design is about helping you move the eye in such a way that, that, that allows you to feel the movement of this. Mm -hmm. You know? And then, bam! <laughs> anyway. That's very cool. Yeah, that's great. I mean, look at the symmetry that's going on in here, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, that's so clear, like, that's where that thing is going to land. Yes. Let me see something here. Oh, look at that. Wow. <laughs> oh, my. I, I get really excited, so you got to be careful. <laughs> I mean, right here is that vertical. Boom, I just went from the corner here down to the bottom. And when that when you come right back up, it comes right in the center of that turkey. Mm -hmm. Why why didn't that you know line end here or over here? 
Now I'm kind of curious if I flip it, what happens? Interesting. It does create that nice spacing though, that pacing. That's interesting. So, um, but that, that gets into the spacing section of, of which is a couple of weeks from now, um, where, where you start learning how to grid things out and, and order your, uh, your designs like that. Okay. But, um, but for right now, we got to just focus on the, on the, uh, the energy and the movement and the, the soul of it. So, all right, guys. Um, Fantastic. That's almost uh, two hours. <laughs> well, quick question about the um, the collection of the five images. Yes. Do, do we need to have like photographs, drawings? How do we know? Right now, you... we're just focused on on the concept. Um, okay. And if like w with your process, what do you do? Do you normally use photos or? Yeah, I take tons and tons of photos. I used to go plein air paint out there at the lake shore, but I found that that limited me to kind of where I was on the lake shore and certain times a day. Mm -hmm. And I was more interested in more dramatic weather. So I just started going out and taking tons and tons of photos. And then what I will do is take some similar ones and try to pull the best from what I've got there to create something. All right. Normally, I wouldn't do this, but for some reason, I'm feeling it with you. Um, <laughs> and that is, I think, at this point, we want to change your process. Okay. Because if you're going out and you're just taking photos and then you're kind of looking at the photos, what you're telling me is you're really not composing the image. You're, you're just kind of looking at what's there and then finding out what, what speaks to you. Um, and so, therefore, the images in a way are the ones who are who are sparking the story no well, it's kind of like you know i try to compose through the camera lens but it's certainly nothing like what i have been observing with what you're doing so what i'd rather you do is at this point grab a sketchbook and go visit the lake in your head Okay. And come up with five stories. And then once you have those stories, then go to the lake with your, with your camera so you can get um, good references. Although you probably already have a billion references. I do. And there's going to be snow on the ground very shortly here. <laughs> yeah. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, so you can either use the references that you have, and now what you're doing is you're coming to the references with a plan. Okay. Okay. I mean, we're just dealing with sky and water and some land. You can, you know, you can flesh all of that stuff out. You've drawn it and painted enough. Um, right. Now, if you're, if you need for the representation, you know, to get those little tiny details and things like that, then that's fine. Um, okay. But most of the people who go through this process realize, oh my gosh, like, you know, they, they use the photos a lot. And then when they go through this process, they, they realize like their photo was used maybe just to kind of get a clear idea up front. And then they revisit them when they get into the value section again. But for the most, but, but they realize like 98% of the process is out of their head. And they're not used to that. Although, you know, and they're, they're used to having the references. Um, I would say I'm in that camp of having all the references and not so much out of my head. And, and why do you think compared to, you know, from what we've been talking about, why do you think uh, so many artists use the references so much? Well, I think a lot of it is that they were never taught a design concept or idea about how to start from there. 
it's basically you go out looking for something look, that looks good. So you snap the picture and. and so it's because they approach it from, they're looking for the nouns. They're looking for what they're going to represent. Yes. And, and we start it from the spirit. What is the energy? Yes. What is the idea? What is, and, and you can't really put a noun to those things. What is the feeling, the mood that you want to experience? And then designing it from there, and then we go get the references to to um, okay, you know. So in a weird way, from our perspective, the reference part of it is important, but it's kind of um, putting the cart before the horse. Mm-hmm. You know. Okay. And uh, I, I know I, I drew this one. I wrote up this one thing that said. Um, let me see what it here. One second that composing is like um, R&D research. <laughs> um, like your references are really just for your research. So you, put, you put your sketch out, your idea, go get your references. Um, and that's kind of like the research part of it. The composition is the development. We were developing this this idea or this product, right? And then when you actually produce it, um, that's when you bring in your style and your medium and you execute on the design, on the composition. And, um, and so that's one way you can look at it. So references are good, but you're going to be spending most of your time on, in the development part of it. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, it does. Cool. All right. Any other questions? Uh, Barb, do you have any questions as well? No, I don't. I can't think of anything. Cool. So on Mm -hmm. Sunday, will it mostly be talking about all of these ideas or what are we going to do on Sunday? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come with uh, your your collection, you know, uh, the title of your collection. By title, I just mean like um, I'm going to do water scenes, right? Do flowers, whatever it is, right? Um, And then – Putting in those, let's say you do the water scene. You know, one, one question you could ask yourself is, when I'm in front of the water, I feel, you know, and answer that question. I feel small. I feel empowered. I feel uh, intimate. I feel expansive. Whatever it might be. I can tell you, I always feel connected with the universe. Okay. Well, that is way too big. <laughs> What are five aspects of being connected to the universe? Okay. Okay. That's that's a good question. You know, one thing that I think, uh, a a thought I had when I was listening to Deb talk about how she loves seeing the patterns and things, Mm -hmm. uh, there is a reason why she loves seeing the patterns and things. The patterns in things make her feel something. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's what she needs to um, investigate. That's what she needs to be able to define. Yes, yep. she loves the patterns, but why? What is it making you feel that is so special to you? So, so Deborah, that could be your collection, you know, um, the patterns in water. Or, or, or you might even call it, you might even put a title on it, the patterns of Lake Michigan or whatever the, the lake is. What lake is it again? Lake Michigan, you're right. right. You know, well, the patterns of Lake Michigan or, or, or seeing, seeing into the lake or whatever it might, you know, something like that. And okay. um, you can already begin to see how, like, the lake becomes a metaphor for the universe and, um, and your connection to it. Um, and then going into like, like, uh, Barbara was saying those five elements of how, how does that make you feel, you know, when you're looking into those patterns and, um, and we can focus on those patterns as you compose that work out. Okay. Using line and space, you can totally see how you can begin to make these beautiful rhythmic images. Um, well, I was seeing that with the uh the clouds mm-hmm. and we had those like 
kind of echo shapes of the curves. I thought, oh, that's so cool because that's kind of repeating a pattern idea. Mm -hmm. And it can be carried on with the sky. And so that's really intriguing to me. Cool. So with you, uh, what I will focus with you on then is creating some type of rhythmic uh, musicality in the in your work. Um, okay. I like the fact that you you not only saw the waves, but you said every seven out, it would repeat itself. So what you're doing is you're creating these little sets. Like okay. there's, there, there's sets of smaller waves that then repeat themselves, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's pretty powerful. So in your work, what, what can be, what can we call the smaller marks or lines within these sets? And the okay. line, and inside these sets, what you're looking at really are a relationship between a mark and the space between the marks. And then how can you repeat that? Um, and uh, because, because the eye is going to see it and it's going to feel it. Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, so, yeah. You're going to become the lady in the lake. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm totally loving this. We got the wildflower and we got the lady in the lake. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of excited to see what Connie and Kathy's names will become. <laughs> Very cool. Good? Yeah. Awesome. So, hello, everyone. Whoa, <laughs> what'd you pop about a man? <laughs> I'm talking about the lady in the lake. I've been I've been watching you. Oh, have you? Oh shoot, Bill. <laughs> Bill then just did you just get back from Kingston? Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, brother. <laughs> well, hold on one second. Let me I'm gonna uh end the recording here. <laughs>